This is Apostle Calvin Brown of Christ Be Glorified Ministries. Amen. This is a teaching, amen, concerning the tithe. I call this uh, message the question of the tithe. Amen. So there has been an issue uh, in the body of Christ concerning tithe, whether it is for today or whether it is not for today. And so we decided to go into the word of God to, to get the truth because you know, any issues about the word is not based on opinions. It's, ba it's not based on what a person thinks. It's based on the truth, and the truth is found in the word of God. Amen. The, the truth, the Bible says, is from Jesus. Amen. So Jesus brings us the truth. So whether you're reading in the Law and the Prophets, so the Old Testament is called the Law and the Prophets. Amen. Uh, you, you know that the law of Moses and but also the prophets, the major and the minor prophets, the Psalms and all those things. So whether you're reading the law and the prophets, the gospels, the four gospels or the epistles um, that uh, mainly the apostles wrote, you're responsible for the truths that are found in there. So, so we have a question. Amen. And so we need to find what is the, the truth or the essence of of the truth of the question that is asked. The, the question that is asked is concerning the tithe, whether it is for today or whether it's not, whether it phased out, you know, whether it was under the law and then phased out. So first of all, it's not God's will for there to be lingering questions concerning his word. It's not okay. You know, some people say, you know, you have your opinion, I have my opinion, but with God is, is not so. That God is very resolute concerning his word, amen. His word is absolutely true and it is forever settled in heaven. And so God has given his word, amen, through the prophets and through the apostles, mainly God has given his, his words, especially for the New Testament. You know, people have diminished the office of the apostle and, and that's how the word came to the church. That's how the word came to the body of Christ. So it is It is mainly by the prophets and the apostles. And I'll show you that in the word of God. And, and no, the apostles have not faded out, phased out. And uh, we, we can get into that also. So it is, it is not God's will for there to be lingering questions about the word of God. Unanswered questions about the word foster confusion and it causes a lack of power and it can stop the blessing. The Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And so if things are not settled, if, you, if you're not operating in the truth of that word, then you cannot get the benefit of the word. The word is seed, the seed produces. And so that what the word produces, amen, is the benefit or the blessing that God designed for you. Everything that God has given unto you is so that you can be blessed. Amen. First Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in the churches of the saints. Amen. So the devil is the author of confusion. Amen. God is not the author of confusion. Amen. God is line upon line, precept upon precept. And everything that the devil touches is corrupted. It falls apart. It goes into a state of disorder. So when there is a, a lack of stability, amen, that is not of God. That, that is the devil trying to undermine the solid word of God. You know, the Bible talks about that. I'm afraid of you, that you, you may have entered into the same type of deception that Eve entered into, you know, so the devil enticed her and deceived her, amen, concerning, concerning the word of God, amen. So the kingdom of God comes by the word and by the Holy Spirit to bring divine order. So everything in a natural realm goes into a state of corruption, but everything that God brings, he brings peace to the body of Christ. He brings peace to the church. He brings everything into divine order. Amen. He gets rid of, he gets rid of confusion. Amen. So before I teach about the tithe, you would have to 
suppose that a person would have to have faith to tithe because the Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Amen. And so you would have to see that the, the, the underpinnings of tithing would have to be in the word and then you would have to have faith to tithe or you would be quiet about it until you got understanding and knowledge about it because you would not want to be a one who fosters that confusion. You understand God is not the author of confusion and his word is forever settled in heaven. The Bible says, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God, but that which is revealed is for us and our children forever. Amen. So if it is revealed, amen, it is, it is for us. Amen. And so we have to receive everything that God gives is like a gift. It must, it must be received. Amen. And so Romans Chapter 10, verse 17, it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm going to give you some word today concerning tithe so that you can have faith. You can have ears to hear. Amen. Having the same spirit of faith, the Bible says, we believe, therefore we speak. And so out of hearing faith, then you will begin to speak faith and then you will begin to do faith. Amen. And so the, the purpose, the object of all the things of God concerning his word is for sound doctrine, for us to be of the same mind and of one accord. That is in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Amen. Because God is one. The Bible says, even when Jesus says the great commandment, he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is is one. Therefore, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. And so God's desire is to bring the body of Christ into oneness and unity <laughs> around the word of God as the word is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you may have the word and that you may have a hundred interpretations of that word without the Holy Spirit. And so it is the Holy Spirit that brings us into a place of peace. That's what peace means. One with the Lord. Amen. And so God has called us to righteousness. Righteousness is what God intended from the beginning when he made everything good and right. And so righteousness, amen, is God's gift to mankind to bring us into, into peace, into divine order. Amen. And so this is, these are just foundational verses before I get into the actual teaching about the tithe. In Psalms 133, the book of Psalms 133. Amen. So this concept of being of one mind and one accord, hallelujah, and, and operating in the peace of God by being in one mind and one accord. That means we're flowing with the Lord. Amen. Psalms 133, beginning with verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Is like the dew of Harmon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing life forevermore. So the commanded blessing is life forevermore. Flows down from the head. That is as if the Bible says flowing down from Zion. So what is right and what is righteous, amen, what is the truth flows down from God 
to the head. And it mentions Aaron being the set one. There was, there was um, much strife and murmuring against Moses and against Aaron. There, there was much contention because the people, the children of Israel had a problem with Moses being the one that God chose and with Aaron being the one that God chose, amen. That, that, that God put Aaron, amen, in charge of the, 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 the Levites over um, his tabernacle, over the offerings of the Lord, ministering unto God. So Aaron represents the ministers of the Lord. And so the oil, which represents the anointing, flows down from Zion, which is, which is heaven, to Zion in this earth. When we agree with God in this earth and operate in the same kingdom anointing and power, then the church is called Zion. If you're in disagreement with the Lord, you're not operating as, as Zion. So the oil flows down from the Lord and from Jesus unto the set one, amen, representing um, it was Aaron in this instance, and it flows down from the head. So it doesn't start up from the bottom. Oil doesn't flow from the bottom, amen. It flows from the head. And you know where this is getting to when Christ ascended on high, gave gifts unto men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, amen. So what the church needs flows down from the head, amen. And so we're answering questions, amen. So it is what the church needs. The church needs answers. It needs solutions, amen. It needs the truth, amen, to operate in the word of God. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is power, the power of God unto salvation unto those who believe. Amen. And so it is the gospel, which is good news. Amen. From the word of God, there must be power. Amen. For instance, Jesus says that if I cast out devils by the Holy Ghost, then is the kingdom of God come unto you. So the, the kingdom of God is realized through the word of God, but not just the word. Paul says, I don't come with just words, but power. And so the word is circumvented if you don't know the truth of the word. You don't receive the power. You don't receive the blessing of that word. Acts chapter 6. I want to show you how God answers questions when they come up in the body of Christ. Acts. The book of Acts chapter 6. Verses 1 through 7. Now, those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, that was the Greeks or the Gentiles, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So we see a problem here. We see a complaint. Okay. Then the 12 apostles summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So a problem comes up, the same thing about the issue of tithe. This is not a new issue. 
and there's been a problem with tithes, but it is it is it is clear, amen, or interesting that the tithes was not a problem in previously in the Bible. In Bible days, tithe, tithe, the concept of tithing was not a problem. Amen. Even in the early church, we do not see it as an issue. We we see it preached on, we see it taught, but we don't see it as it is a problem. Amen. So how does God um, answer problems? How does God solve problems? So there, there was an issue that came up about the, the Hellenists said that their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And so the apostles appointed deacons. Amen. They laid hands on them. In other words, it was given unto the apostles to lay hands on elders. Elders, deacons and elders were help to the apostles so that there would be peace in the church. The answer came from the apostles. Amen. So, so it is good that an apostle, if, if those who don't know me and my wife, we are apostles. Though we are married, God used us as an example of oneness. My wife is submitted unto me. So she operates in the same power that I operate as she is submitted unto me. She is one with me. Amen. So as one man, we minister in, in the spirit. Amen. I'm her head and she is my helper. Amen. My helpmeet. Amen. And so God has placed us in the body of Christ to be an example to show how the church is supposed to operate. So we read Psalms 133, it all flows down from the head. So when there is an issue in the church, it is good to go to an apostle. So you have to know who is actually an apostle. Amen. So this is not the teaching for that. But you know, an apostle has had a visitation from the Lord Jesus who appointed them as an apostle, just like in the Bible. Amen. Paul had a visitation of Jesus. The rest of the apostle had seen Jesus. Amen. And so in essence, even modern day apostles have seen Jesus and received their commission from Jesus himself. And so the apostle and the prophets, the Bible says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Amen. And so the government of God, the apostles are mentioned first, not because apostles are trying to be anything, but in the government of God, that, that, that word was given to the apostles. And so we are stewards over that word even now, and we are stewards over the mysteries of God. When something is unknown, it is a mystery. But if it is for the body of Christ, then the apostles are stewards over that mystery, able to handle that mystery and to uh, give it out and, and give revelation of it to the body of Christ. So there was an issue in the body of Christ. It got to the apostles and the apostles dealt with it and gave an answer, which included help. Amen. In Acts chapter 15, the book of Acts chapter 15, verses 1, I don't know how much I'm going to read, but it's, it's the question of circumcision. It's Acts chapter 15. Um, there was a question about should the Gentiles be circumcised? Amen. So I probably could paraphrase a lot of that. And so that the Judaizers said that the Gentiles should be, should be circumcised. And so they brought it to the apostles, amen, for the, for the answer, for the conclusion, amen. And so Peter rehearsed how that God had chosen him to give him that vision, you know, about that sheep being let down from heaven and all manner of, of beast four-footed beasts and creeping things and unclean things. And a voice came to Peter and say, said, slay and eat. He said, not so, Lord, for nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. And the word says that Jesus says that what I have cleansed, let no man call common. And so it was a vision 
And so after that was when Cornelius came, you know the whole deal, that the Holy Ghost fell upon Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and his household, just like it did on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And so Peter had this experience from the Lord where the Lord was teaching him. Amen. And so they, they came to the conclusion that they would not lay that burden. They would not lay that burden on the Gentiles because it was associated with, with something that was in the past. Amen. In the, in the, in the Old Testament or, or in the law concerning God's people. But there was a clearer revelation. And that's important. There was a clearer revelation about circumcision that which was not the fleshly circumcision. Amen. And so I'm just showing you something about handling, handling the word of God. God did not get rid of circumcision, but it was seen in another light. It was seen in a, in a, in a, another level of glory. Amen. In Romans chapter two, Romans chapter two. Verses, Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. It says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart. In the spirit, not of, of, in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So God did not get rid of circumcision, but in the dispensation, because people are asking about the dispensation of grace, amen. Circumcision continued, but it is described, not that which is of the outward of the flesh, but inwardly the circumcision, which is of the heart. So the thing, the statute that God does not get rid of, that you see elements of it before the law, you see elements of it during the law, you see elements of it after the law is called an ordinance. Amen. And so we see the ordinance of circumcision. As long as time continues, amen, God did not get rid of it. The only question is, or you seeing it literally, amen, or is it a type, amen? So tithing, I will show you, is an ordinance, amen. It is not a question whether tithing occurred before the law, during the law, and after the law. Therefore, it would be an ordinance. It would be something that is a statute that is mandated by God to continue as long as time continues. Amen. And so your, your only question would have to be, is does it continue in its literal form or is it a type or shadow? Amen. We see it again in Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter three and verse three. Again, speaking of circumcision, it says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, who rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So circumcision is the people of God. And so in the act of circumcision, which is seen in the, in the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets, that's the Old Testament, amen. And that you even see in the gospels, amen. So it is it is before the law, it is during the law, amen, and it is, it is after the law, therefore it is, it is an ordinance, and it continues, amen, when our heart is circumcised, we become the people of God, when we go after God in the spirit, worship him in the spirit, amen, when we seek God, amen, God is seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so 
circumcision was not gotten rid of. Somebody says, yes, it was. I say, no, it wasn't. It's an ordinance, which is in the word of God. Amen. And so such also is, is, is tithe. Amen. Matthew 5, 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. And our life is, is found in him. And as he is, so are we in this earth. Amen. And, and Jesus' obedience unto God afforded us that the, the, the opportunity and the wherewithal to be, to be obedient, to be obedient unto God. Amen. The, the Bible says, and in, in, in you can look up this scripture, that when we love, we fulfill the law. So let me tell you, so, so the law was good. The things that were written in the law were good. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. But the only thing that's changed is how we perform. That in the Old Testament, they did not have the ability to keep it. Amen. Now we do when we walk in love, we fulfill, the Bible says, the righteous commandments of the law. Amen. So you don't get rid of the law. Amen. Or let me put it this way, because I want to say it right. You don't get rid of the truths that are found in the law. Amen. You, you rightfully say we are in a new dispensation, but the Bible clearly says that a person that loves, he would not steal, he would not kill, he would not commit adultery. Everything that the law says. Amen. And so you would have to ask yourself, amen, is giving tithes. Amen. Tithes means a tenth. Amen. Would that be a righteous element? Amen. Would that, would, let's, let's look at it in a broader sense and then we'll bring it to the tithe. Is, is giving a good thing? Amen. Yes, giving is a good thing. Did God call us to give? Yes, God says give and it shall be given unto you. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, giving is who God is. It, it is the nature of God for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. That whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I want you to think and just consider. Okay. So it is, it is good to give. Amen. And it is good to purpose. The Bible says, let each man give as he purposes in his heart. Amen. And then we see that a type of giving, which is called a tithe, is seen before the law. Well, I'll show you that during the law and after the law. I'll, I'll go through that very quickly. Amen. Which means it is an ordinance which continues. And so you would only have to ask yourself, OK, does it continue literally or is it a type in a shadow? that we operate in and that we're supposed to continue because we know we're supposed to give. And we know that the, the law is good. We know that the word is good. We know that tithing is good. Nothing wrong with, with giving as you purpose a, a certain percent, amen, that is given as unto the Lord. We know that there would not be something wrong with that, amen. The people who tithe have no problem with tithing. It's the people that don't tithe that have a problem with tithing. Amen. So an ordinance, amen, is, is something that is given by God throughout time as a gift, as an example to teach. Elements can be seen before, during, and after the law. It represents a truth. And from God's perspective, an ironclad truth. Amen. Just like the Sabbath, I'll mention another one, just like the Sabbath. You said, the Bible says in the law, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Amen. So that is a truth. But there is a greater um, essence of glory on that truth. When we find out what the Sabbath is, 
in that newer dispensation in Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 10, it says, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So that rest is the Sabbath, the Bible says, where we cease from our own labors. We cannot do it without the Lord. That's what grace is, God's unmerited favor. Amen. We could not do it without the Lord. So we, we don't trust in our own works. We trust in the works that God did in the beginning and the works that Jesus did, which confirm the works that God did. The how Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Amen. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Amen. Open blind eyes. He confirmed that the works that he were doing was God's works. Amen. And he says, come unto me all who labor and, every, and who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Amen. So that's what he's talking about, the Sabbath. So, so when you read in the Old Testament, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and you look at the dispensation that it means that we're not supposed to trust in our own works, but we are supposed to enter in and receive what God has already worked. That is our rest, how God rested on the seventh day, amen, that we are supposed to enter into that rest. That's the Sabbath. So that, that part of the law that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is not done away with. Amen. We are still doing that today in this dispensation of grace. Amen. And so we, we, we just have to have the revelation of the greater glory. Amen. The, the revelation of the greater glory. The Bible says, I won't turn there. It says that even when Moses is read today, it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That just Moses had a veil over his face because the people could not stand to look at the glory that was shining on him, even though that time or that dispensation, that glory was fading away, but it was glory. Amen. And so the Bible says that we with unveiled faces as in a mirror that we look into the glory as we behold the glory, we, we are changed into the same image. The Bible says the same veil, just like Moses had a veil, is, is still in place when many people read the Old Testament. Amen. I wish I had time to turn there, but you, you read it. Amen. You, you read it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The same veil is there when people read the Old Testament. They don't see this greater glory. They said, oh, glory has no glory compared to the greater glory. So we always operate in the greater glory. The, the, the old glory was true, but there is a greater revelation of that glory. Amen. And so... Um, one more, and then, then I'll get into this tithe um, in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Paul says, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. <clears throat> so we see that in the Old Testament and under the law, they kept the Passover. And then in the New Testament, in the epistles, the Bible says to keep the feast, keep this Passover feast, get rid of the leaven. For a little leaven, leaven is the lump. He's talking about sin. He's talking about, and this is the sin that was in the church, but sin that's in your life or anything that corrupts so keeping the Passover in this new dispensation is getting rid of the sin, 
getting rid of wickedness and malice. It's getting it's getting that leaven out of the house because they had to get rid of the leaven when they when they prepared the Passover to eat the Passover. They had to get rid of the the leaven. Amen. So it is an ordinance that the Passover. You don't have to do the Jewish. Feast. I hear some people, you know, they're doing the Jewish feast. No, the Bible didn't say that. The Bible says that the Passover, amen, is to get rid of the leaven that leaveneth the lump. So it is an ordinance, the things that God placed for an ordinance. And and if we get to it, I'm going to show you that the tithe is an ordinance. God calls it an ordinance. Amen. An everlasting ordinance ordinance. Amen. So so let's <laughs> quickly, all that was foundation. Let's get into the tithe before the law in Genesis. The book of Genesis chapter 14 verses 18 18, 18 through 23. It says, then Melchizedek, Melchizedek king of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High. And he blessed him, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him, Abram gave him a tithe of all. Now, the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand. In other words, I vowed a vow. I raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say that I've made Abram rich. Amen. So we see some principles here that Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek. So Abram, who is Abraham, who became Abraham, who is the father of faith. This is what I want you to see, that the when you read the Old Testament, the Bible says the Old Testament, the law is a schoolmaster. Amen. It teaches you. Amen. So Abram became Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith. He paid tithes to Melchizedek, who is a type of Jesus, that Abraham vowed a vow to the Lord. He entered into contract with the Lord that he would only trust the Lord for to, to make him rich or to take care of him or to prosper him. He would only trust the Lord. We know that Sodom was wicked, Sodom and Gomorrah. We, we already know how wicked they were. And so the, the king of Sodom is trying to offer him something. He says, he says no, hey, man, I will not take anything. This is, this is the Sodom. It's a type of this world, this worldly system and all like that. And so it is, it is Abraham is, is operating out of actually intimacy with the Lord, knowing the Lord. Amen. So out of knowing the Lord, he vowed a vow that only the Lord could make him rich and he paid a tithe. So that is, that is before the law that Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek who is a type of Jesus. Now, remember this. Remember that Abraham is the father of faith. Okay, we'll we'll pick up that on a little bit. Amen. In Galatians, Galatians chapter three, the book of Galatians chapter three, Verses six and seven. It says, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Amen. 
So those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. We are called sons of Abraham. You say, why is that? Because Abraham believed God. That's faith. That's the just shall live by faith. Abraham operated by faith. He believed God. Amen. And we came from Abraham, so to speak, even though we came from Jesus. But I'm saying the family of faith, amen, came from physical Abraham. Amen. And so we are children of Abraham by faith. We see it again in Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 4. Verse 11, Romans 4, 11, <clears throat> it says, and he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had when he was still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. So this is, you're going to have to catch this. Amen. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Amen. We are sons and daughters of Abraham. Amen. By faith. Abraham operated by faith. He believed God. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. Amen. And so Abraham received the seal of circumcision when he was uncircumcised. And so we as Gentiles, we were uncircumcised, yet we received the seal of righteousness. I already told you what circumcision was. Amen. The circumcision of the heart to be people of God. Amen. To be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we have received righteousness just like Abraham by walking in the faith of Abraham. What type of faith did Abraham have? Amen. Well, Abraham paid tithes unto Melchizedek. Amen. And so we'll see that also in the, in the New Testament. It describes it even further what, what took place. Abraham, the father of faith, we are children of Abraham. The father of faith paid tithes to Melchizedek, a type of Jesus, who is the priest, the high priest of the most high God. Mm -hmm. So he's he's the high priest is one who, who handles offerings and, and sacrifices. He's he's on the behalf. The high priest, this is not according to the order of Levi. Amen. But Melchizedek, amen, was not for of Levi, amen. So, so his priesthood abides forever. We will, we will see that it continues. So it is incumbent upon a high priest to have something to offer, amen, to have offerings, amen, to present, to present to God, amen, on behalf of the people. So um, what I'm trying to show you is that by faith, the tithe is an offering which is, is working on behalf of God's people that are presented to Melchizedek because we operate by the same faith that Abraham. We believe God. <laughs> Amen. And so we receive righteousness from believing God. So we see in Genesis chapter 14, that was before the law. Genesis, Abraham paid tithes. Okay, so Genesis, again, Genesis chapter 28. <clears throat> Let me make sure that's right. Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 <clears throat> through 22. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba, and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and his top reached to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father. 
and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and all your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I'm with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what have I spoken, what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, took the stone that he had put at his head, and set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been lust previously. Bethel means the house of God. Then Jacob made a vow. Amen. Just like Abraham made a vow. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on. So I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So we see Jacob paid tithes un unto the Lord. He vowed a vow after. Now get this. After he met the Lord, God introduces himself as a God of Abraham and Isaac. So God introduced himself to Abraham. And Abraham entered into that intimacy with the Lord, made a vow. God introduced himself unto Isaac. Amen. And we see how God blessed Isaac, amen. He he sowed in a time of famine and reaped a hundredfold, amen. And so God introduces himself, amen, to Jacob. So it is an encounter with the Lord that released the vow to tithe. And in, in other words, Jacob had been going on, but now God introduces himself as the covenant God. This is what he's saying. He says, I'm a covenant God. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. That means covenant. Now I am the God of Jacob because Jacob received him as a covenant God. And we see that when Jacob did these things, vowing the vow, paying the tithe, that God blessed his life and increased him and prospered him. But he was not really open to do that until he had an encounter with the Lord. So many times with tithing, you would have to have a revelation from the Lord. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You cannot have faith for something unless you hear it and that word be a living word. The Bible says the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Amen. And so the spirit on the word, if you will receive the spirit of the, of the word, did you know that your spirit is made to receive the word of God. Your spirit is made to receive the things that are of, are of the spirit. Amen. You can test what is of the spirit, whether it is whether it is of the Lord by the by the witness. Jesus said in St. John chapter 8, he says, "Why do you don't receive my word? Because my word has no place in you." Because you don't have my desires, but the desire of the devil you will do. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of the devil you will do. You must have the Lord's desire. The, the, the spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord, enlightening all the inward parts of the belly. So, so in here is your spirit. When you're born again and when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, Spirit likens unto spirit. So you're, you're able to receive spiritual things. The carnal mind is enmity against God. In enmity, it is hostile toward the things that are of the spirit. So we see the tithe before the law. And quickly, we'll see the tithe during the law. Amen. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. In Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, chapter 27, <clears throat> verses 30 
through 33. And God says, and all the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So the tithe means to set apart that tenth as holy to the Lord. And if a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one that is exchanged for it shall be holy and shall not be redeemed. Amen. So this is during the law of Leviticus. This is during the time of the law. And there's the institution of the tithe. We see it in Numbers chapter 18. The book of Numbers chapter 18. Verses 21 through 24. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes of Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform. So this is talking about the ministers. Amen. That Aaron is the sons. They are the priests. Aaron is the high priest. The son is the priest. But the tribe of, of Levi of all the tribes God chose to serve him. So it's talking about the ministry, that they did not have a regular inheritance. Amen. And so because they did not have a regular inheritance, God gave them the tithe so that they could continue to serve him. Amen. Now, this is in the Old Testament, but it's saying something also in the New Testament. So it says... Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity, and it shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. So God says right here is an ordinance. He says this institution of the tithe and taking care of that minister through the tithe, he says it is a statute Forever. It is, it is an ordinance. So when I told you it was an ordinance, I did not make that up. It is, it is in the word of God. So you, ay, 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 you have to know how, hallelujah, to see it from beginning to end. Jesus, he opened their eyes as he walked on the road to Emmaus. He showed where he was in the scriptures from beginning to end. Amen. See, the revelation... Whatever is an ordinance would only increase in the glory. Amen. It would only increase in the glory. Amen. Deuteronomy. Hallelujah. I know my time is about spent as far as what we can record in this session. We'll just make another recording if I go over. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 8 and 9. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to stand before the Lord and to minister to him and to bless his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. So we see the institution of the tithe in this in this instance, is to take care of the ministry. The ministers, they're not, to, not, they are not supposed to be given to working secular jobs. They are supposed to stand before the Lord and minister for the Lord and unto the Lord and to the, the people, things that pertain to the tabernacle of God or the house of God, amen, are supposed to be taken care of by the tithe so that they can be separated unto the Lord and keep themselves holy and keep themselves from being corrupted and polluted by the things which are of the world. Amen. And then we see in Malachi chapter three, the book of Malachi chapter three, the, this, this is the, often the, the book, the passage of scripture that is quoted about the tithe. 
and in verses 6 through 12. Amen. I wanted to start a little bit ahead because I want you to see that word ordinance again. Um, Malachi chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So I'm the Lord your God, I, do, I change not. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances. So, so God is telling them that they have left his ordinances, his statutes, that which was before the law. Amen. During the law and after the law is what an ordinance is to teach you. An ordinance is to teach you. It's like the, the ordinance of the head covering. It is like the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Amen. It is, it is to teach you a truth. Amen. It says, um, you've gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall... We return. Will a man rob God? Yet you'll rob me. But you say, in what way have you have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, let me say about giving. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. And giving is a free will offering, but it is it is for us. It is a gift so that God can bless us. Amen. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground nor the vine, nor shall your vine fail to bear fruit. For you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So he's called the Lord of hosts, meaning that the captain of the armies of the Lord and even the angelic armies will fight for you, amen, concerning this issue about the tithe, amen. Well, you said that is, that is Old Testament. And so I have a question for you in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, it says, But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is a mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. So the question is, if God is doing all this stuff under the law and the prophets, and the Bible says that we have a better covenant based on better promises, and Jesus is the mediator of this covenant that's based on better promises, wouldn't it be just as good as that in the Old Testament and better? <laughs> okay. Wouldn't it include that? Amen. In the Old Testament. Remember. God did not say, don't read the Old Testament. Amen. You just have to get the truth out of the Old Testament. I, I've heard ministers counsel people, don't spend much time in the Old Testament. And yet that's where all the truths, much of the truths are. That Paul used the Old Testament to explain everything he did in the New Testament. He'll say, as it is written, he'll give an Old Testament scripture. Amen. In the Gospels, they would use an Old Testament scripture to explain what is going on in the New Testament. So it's a danger, amen, of a veil coming down on you if, if you have a wrong idea about how to receive from the Old Testament or not to receive from the Old Testament, amen. And so in Luke, we'll read this very quickly. And like I said, if my time is is spent, we'll divide this into two, two teachings. Amen. Two 30-minute teachings. If, amen. In the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 42. Jesus says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So Jesus says that they were, they were hypocritical. 
They were religious and they were tithing even of the herbs. Jesus says they passed by the weightier issues of mercy and justice. These they ought to have done without leaving the other undone. And so Jesus is trying to touch and tune into their hearts to get them to, to open up their hearts. But at the same time, he did not. He says, it's okay. It is good for you to do the tithe, but you should also be connected in your heart. So just like I explained about the Old Testament, you're doing things unto God by your heart, just like Abraham, just like Jacob. Amen. You're doing things unto God from your heart, the way your issues, but you should not have left the others undone. You should, you should have done the tithe in the offerings. Amen. This is what he was saying. You see that also in Matthew 23 and 23. Amen. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of, of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And so he's saying that these are supposed to know the law, but they did not. They did not get the truth, the glorious truth out of the law. Amen. They were doing it religiously. Amen. And this is what I wanted to get to. And I'll, I'll end with this in Hebrews chapter seven. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter seven. Hallelujah. Verses one through nine. So we already read about how Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and Abraham, out of that blessing, gave a tenth, a tithe. First being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Amen. Now, consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. Amen. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better or the greater. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he, Jesus, receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. And even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Amen. So that's, that's a lot. My time is, is spent, but it, this is what I want you to understand, that we said that Abraham was the father of faith, paid tithes to Melchizedek, who was a type of Jesus. Jesus had a different priesthood, amen, because the problem with the Levitical priesthood was that they continually died and had to be replaced. But Jesus is a high priest who abides forever. He's a mediator of the covenant, amen. So Jesus brings us into covenant. One aspect of it is through the tithe, amen, to bless us, amen. And his priesthood abides forever. So all that stuff that was going on in Genesis in the Old Testament was actually setting us up today for a greater blessing, a better blessing, amen, that we have a better covenant based on better promises. Now, check this out. The, the, the Bible talks about that we are the, 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 the image, we made in the image of God and that we are his 
his offspring. Amen. The, the Bible says, by these exceeding great and precious promises that we are partakers of God's divine nature. Amen. By the word of God, that's the promises of God. We have better promises. We have a, a better covenant based on better promises. So we are to partake of the divine nature of God to give. You cannot, you cannot argue that God has called us. God has called us. Amen. We know that God has called us to give. So now we're only talking about what percentage as we purpose in our heart. And we've seen in the word of God that the tithe is offered for those who will receive it as an ordinance. Amen. Just like the Lord's Supper is offered as an ordinance to those who would receive it and, and implement it the right way. The head covering is given as an ordinance for those who will receive it. Amen. As long as, as, as life continues, the earth continues. Amen. Those ordinances are in place for those who will receive it. Amen. And so hopefully that I've answered some questions about is the tithe for today? Yes. For those who will receive it. It is an ordinance before, during, and after the law. Amen. There is a blessing attached to it that is greater, greater than we know. Amen. Because we have a better covenant based on better promises. Amen. So thank you for listening to this word. I just bless you in the name of Jesus. Bless the hearers of this word in Jesus name. Amen.